Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sun Huang. I'm a postdoc at Santa Cruz. And uh, for the next 15 minutes, I will remain on the topic of galaxy halo connection. But instead, I will focus on the low redshift and the high halo mass end. And uh, here is a list of my uh, collaborators. I want to mention that this work is uh, get help a lot of, uh, from a lot of a local uh, graduate and, and undergraduate students. And I also want to mention that the work I present today is using the data collected from the Hyper Supreme camera, the new prime focus camera on board of the 8.2 meter uh, Subaru telescope. And uh, I hope you agree with me that after two decades of effort, right now we have a pretty good idea of what the average stellar to halo mass relation should look like at the low redshift. So here is just an incomplete list of recently published stellar halo mass relation I gathered from literature and uh, halo mass on the axis, stellar mass on the y-axis. I realized that once I homogenize all the moving parts, the definition of a halo mass, the IMF, cosmology, etc., all these constraints are consistent with each other exceedingly well in the halo mass range between 10 to 11.5 to almost 10 to the 13, basically the Milky Way uh, mass halo. At the same time, this is very good news, but at the same time, I want to focus on the high mass end where the things get a little tricky. Uh, we can see that uh, different uh, constraints do show discrepancies, and there could be a lot of reason behind this. For example, the data could be different, uh, and each method has its own vulnerability, and uh, we all know that to constrain halo mass is not an easy job. But in this talk, I will focus on the y-axis. I want to draw your attention to one point that above 10 to 11.0 solar mass, all this massive galaxy have this early time morphology. They have extended structure, hence to mirror their stellar mass actually will give you a headache. And to uh, someone lower the, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I uh, just want to show some nice pictures. And to illustrate the point, I hope you can see that this is the three color GRI band images of a tiny piece of sky from the 2.5 meter SDSS telescope. I hope you can see that we already can, nice. Uh, we already can see that there are bound, there's over density of red and early type galaxies here, indicating that there could be a massive galaxy cluster, hence massive halo. However, let's switch to the fancy HSE camera. Now you can see things much better. Now you can see the details in the very outskirts of all these massive galaxies. You can see much more light, and also you can see many, many more background or satellite galaxy, uh, faint satellite galaxy around this structure. So this image like this is part of an ongoing and ambitious cosmology survey called HSC survey uh, using the HSC camera. Uh, it is producing uh, high quality and a deep image like this consistently over a large range of sky in five band. Uh, I hope I can convince you that this is a perfect data set to study the stellar mass distribution and the halo uh, properties of these massive galaxies. So for image like this, what we can do about it? Uh, the first thing we can do is put down some isofold that trace the light distribution of these galaxies. From this, uh, we can mirror the average surface mass density profile along the major axis of these galaxies all the way to the very faint outskirt. At the same time, we can also trace how the shape of the isofold change with radii. So here, I show the ellipticity. Now, this is very simple and straightforward, and there's already a lot we can learn from this. Uh, using a large sample of mass galaxy between redshift 0 0.2 to 0 0.5, uh, we realized that the stellar halo around this massive galaxy is not self-similar. On the left side, I show the surface mass density profile for the, all these galaxies and separate them into three mass spins and show their median profiles. The x-axis is actually r to the one quarter uh, in KPC. Uh, the shaded inner region show where the PSF bothers us and the shaded region in the outskirts show where the background subtraction bothers us. But even with these constraints, we can still recover the, light, uh, the mass profile of these galaxies individually to, uh, to more than 100 kbc. All the scatter here you, uh, you see actually intrinsic. And uh, this side I show the ellipticity profiles of this galaxy in the same manner. We also see interesting trend 
with stellar mass, basically as the galaxy become more and more massive, uh, it start to have more and more extended stellar distribution. And the outskirt, the stellar halo of this galaxy become more and more elliptical. This is very interesting. There is a, from this diversity and scatter, there is already a lot we can learn about their mass assembly history, about their connection with, uh, with their halo. But all this detail on the profile is still too complicated for modeling the galaxy halo connection. Fortunately, we can pretty much comprise all those information into two parameters. Basically, the stellar mass within two apertures. For example, let's put down a very large aperture that encapsulates basically the entire, or all the stellar mass within the galaxy. Let's go to 100 kbc. And we can also put down elliptical uh, aperture at the inner region, for example, 10 kbc. This basically gives you the estimate of the mass in the core of the more, uh, now uh, today's massive early type galaxy, and also include basically all the stellar mass that form in its compact high redshift progenitors. Now, this two, the choice of the two apertures sounds arbitrary, but actually is motiva <coughs> sorry, motivated by the so-called two-phase formation scenario of massive galaxies that from hydrodynamical simulations. And uh, this model can predict on the stellar, can reproduce the stellar mass growth and the size evolution of these massive galaxies. The key ingredient of this model is to separate the stars in every galaxy into two physical components. The so-called in-situ stars, which is a star formed in the main progenitor halo of the galaxy, and the ex-situ star, which is a star accreted from all the merging events. And one key prediction at high mass end is that these two components have very different spatial distribution. As you can see here, uh, I'm using one massive simulated galaxy from illustrious simulation as example. So it, if you make a comparison here, basically the inner aperture capture most of the, should capture most of the in-situ light, while the, uh, the mass between 10 and 100 kbc should be dominated by the ex-situ star, the star that are accredited from all the major and minor mergers. Now, if you put, mirror these two aperture masses for a large sample galaxy and then put them on the 2D plane, you can see that massive galaxies actually occupy a pretty wide distribution. And more importantly, we will start to, we start to see interesting trend. So for example, if we isolated the massive galaxy living at the center of massive galaxy cluster, the so-called brightest cluster galaxy, we start to notice that they occupy a little, the systematically different distribution than the others. Basically at the same total set of mass, the one living more massive halo tend to have lower fraction with mass in its inner 10 kbc, has more extended structure and a larger size. And this is interesting. This suggests that somehow the halo, dark matter halo of this galaxy, could determine the stellar mass distribution of its central galaxy. However, we need something more solid. So just to remind you that so far we only explored 100 kbc around the central galaxy. Well, for a massive galaxy like this, oops, sorry, an Olivian very massive dark matter halo that can easily extend to megaparsec on scale. And these massive dark matter halos have very complex assembly history that its relation with the central galaxy is what we really want to get from here. And this is a very difficult job, but fortunately we have a two called weak gravitational lensing. So basically the gravitational influence of the dark matter halo coherently distorted the shape of all the background galaxy. So if we exaggerate this effect by 10,000, 100,000, you will see something like this. But on real data, uh, this trend is actually very subtle and you need to use a statistically large sample to infer this. And thankfully, the HSE data can provide you accurate shape measurement for a lot of background galaxies around this massive halo. So what we can get is this so-called excess of surface mass density around this massive halo, or the delta sigma profile, from the 100 kbc to more than one megaparsec. This is the best tool we can get to directly study the mass distribution in massive halo and large scale structure. And I hope until now, I, can, I already convince you that the data from Hyper Supreme Cam Super Strategy Program or HSE survey is really the perfect data to study galaxy halo connection and high mass, high mass end. This is because HSE survey is a wide survey, so it gives you a lot of sample of these rare massive galaxies, 
It's also a deep survey. It gives you a lot of details and a large number of background galaxies. And it's also a weak lensing survey. Basically give you a tool to explore their dark matter halo uh, directly. So wide, deep lensing. And once you combine these three advantages together, you really have a beautiful tool to directly study probe the galaxy halo connection. So let's go back to the two-dimensional plane defined by the outer aperture mass and the inner aperture 10 kpc mass. And here's the distribution of large sample of nearby massive galaxy. And here, I separate them into three subsamples based on the ranking of their inner mass at fixed photocellular mass. So red ones have lower mass in the inner region and green ones have higher mass in the central region. As you can see in the histogram, they actually share the same total mass distribution. On the right side, I show their median surface mass density profile. And as expected, there is a systematic difference. One, the green one have higher excess mass in the inner region, while the red one is more extended in the outer part. And now let's switch to the weak lens environment. So now we can see that the three samples do have systematically different weak lens profile within one megaparsec. And to make this more clear is that the sample that with higher mass in the central region tend to have lower amplitude, while the sample, the red one here, uh, the more extended one tend to have higher amplitude. This basically gives you the direct evidence that halo mass actually changes systematically across this plane. This is interesting, but actually because HSC is so powerful, we can do much better. So I, again, the same 2D mass plane and the real distribution of galaxy are uh, highlight in the dots here, and please ignore the color density uh, here. Uh, we can actually select a small box in this 2D plane and generate the, and mirror the dirty sigma profile within. And we can change the def definition of the box across this plane. I want you to focus on the corner. And now you can see as the box move around this two-dimensional plane, the amplitude and the shape of the dirty sigma profile change systematically. So this is more, much better way to visualize actually there is a systematic change of halo, halo properties across this 2D plane. Again, very interesting, but we still need a model to explain this. We need to model all these observations. And actually because there is still significant uncertainty in the measurement of stellar mass and the halo mass, we need to forward model this by taking all these uncertainties into account. And by these observations, I mean the stellar mass of the aperture mass defined by these two uh, apertures and all the lensing signals in different mass bins. And I want to show you that right now we can already do this. We already have all the key in ingredients. So first, we start from a large volume dark matter simulation, the small multi-dark Planck one, which gave us the statistics, statistics of a large sample of massive dark matter halos. And next, we make some key assumptions about the stellar mass halo mass relation. And I, I hope you notice that here there's the T, which stands for total stellar mass. In this, we make the assumption that there is a very log log linear and a very tight relation if you use the halo mass and not the mass of the individual galaxy, but the stellar mass of everything inside the halo. And this is actually motivated by recent simulation and observations. And uh, uh, this assumption and uh, uh, this uh, total stellar mass halo mass relation and the behavior of scatter along it give us four free parameters. And now with the total stellar mass within each uh, dark matter halo, we still need to assign the stellar mass of each, uh, each galaxy, which we actually take advantage of a recent published uh, semi-empirical model called Universe Machine. This work done by Peter Baruzzi, 2018 actually jointly constrain the observations at different redshift and predict the in-situ and ex situ mass of each galaxy that consistent with observation. And the last step is we need to distribute this in-situ and ex situ mass into different apertures. And based on some exemptions uh, with three additional parameters, we can, uh, we can already do that. So in total, in all, all combining together, we have a model, empirical model, that is pretty simple with only seven free parameters. And we basically write down likelihood function, provide some uh, realistic prior, and feed them into MCMC sampling machine. What we can get? So actually, the first stop is the stellar mass function. And the data point is the point with the uncertainty range, and the mo our model prediction is a line here. So basically, we can see that 
using this reforward model, we can reproduce the CERMAS, the CERMAS function with total CERMAS, uh, mirrored in outer aperture, and the 10 kVC CERMAS within the inner aperture. And more importantly, this model can reproduce the delta sigma, the weak lensing signal, in a large number of uh, aperture mass bins. Along the x-axis, the total center mass grows, and along the y-axis, the 10 kVC mass grows. Here, all the data are the red points, and our model prediction is a blue point. As you can see, that across the large range of total center mass and the inner mass range, our model provides very good uh, prediction. Just to illustrate how much does the weak lensing signal change across this plane, we use the lensing signal in this bin here as reference, which is shown in green, as you can see here clearly. So, because this model can predict the lensing signal correctly, it naturally gives you a halo mass and a galaxy mass distribution that is consistent with all this recently published stellar halo mass relation. Our prediction for the average stellar mass at a fixed halo mass is the uh, circle here, and the average halo mass at a fixed stellar mass is the triangular here. They're all roughly consistent. But this is not exactly the point. We know it's going to be consistent. The point that is actually we have more information. So what we can get is actually the halo mass trend across this 2D aperture mass plane. And here the color and the contour indicate the halo mass, average halo mass in, uh, inside each of the bin. As you can see here, across this 2D two-dimensional plane, the halo mass increase in this direction uh, significantly. If you look at it here, at fixed stellar mass, basically we are looking at the halo mass uh, s uh, spans of almost 0 0.4, 0 0.5 that, which is very significant. It will be very interesting to look into what causes this, uh, this change and what, uh, uh, how that is related to the halo assembly history. Meanwhile, uh, look at the scatter uh, of the halo stellar halo mass relation, so the stellar mass and the scatter of halo mass. The typical prediction from the normal stellar halo mass relation give you a scatter at 0.25 dax. Well, if we fully employ the information we can get from this 2D plane, we can get a much lower scatter. So in addition to all the, all the information we can get, this, our model, can also serve as a tool that better predict halo mass. So what's next? There is still a lot of improvement that we can do. For example, we can still improve the measurement of stellar mass. Uh, we can look, further look into the damping history of the dark matter halo mass, and we can see how we, uh, we can use it in better ways. Uh, just at this last point, I want to mention that uh, at Santa Cruz, we have an excellent group of graduate and, and undergraduate students that help with us. And their work uh, will greatly help us to improve our model. Uh, on the, so Chris actually is away at Argonne National Lab. He's working on much better and louder simulation to pin down the cost of the scatter around the stellar halo mass relation and to try to find us a better halo mass indicator. And Felipe is working on very careful apples to apple comparison with all those hydro simulation on the market. And please come to uh, his talk tomorrow. And we also have two undergraduate students and Rajdeepa is working on modeling the surface density profile of the in-situ and ex-situ component. And hopefully one day we can change from the aperture mass to the detail of the stellar mass density profiles. And Greg here actually is looking into the satellite fraction at a high halo mass end, which is also a very important uh, prediction of our model. And uh, Please come back next year. I'm sure you will hear more of their researchers. And meanwhile, I encourage you to talk to them. And I will skip this, and uh, thank you very much. Yeah.